free Scaro! Hello, everyone. Welcome to Radio Free Scarrow, episode number 790. I am Stephen at Edmonton. And I am Chris in Edmonton. Warren has, is snowshoeing off into the woods, never to return. Mm, he's going until, to meet the Yeti. Uh, he might be, actually, to Detson Monastery in 1935 is where he's going. Um, they're making a big finish play about that. can't remember. I think we talked about it last week. Where we got the ty- uh, the uh, what you would call it the um, uh, cover art wrong apparently according to the Big Finish Twitter account, but not re- not like we're going to cast shade at Big Finish because they did manage to include a reference to Radio Free Scarrow mm-hmm. in their their launch trailer for the Doomsday Contract, which I thought was yep. quite clever and neat. <laughs> quite clever, neat. The whole trailer was done in the uh, the guide uh, in the uh, style of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, yep. and I, I sat there, uh, cause you sent, sent us a text about, Hey, watch this. So I sat there watching and I'm like, Oh, maybe this is, uh, cause we, we, we were tipped off that we're going to get a mention in one of their trailers. Yeah. Um, so I'm sitting there watching it and I'm like, Oh, all this stuff. Okay. Hitchhiker style. So I'm sitting there freeze framing basically like you would have an old <laughs> Simpsons episode for the, for the sign gags. Uh-huh. And <laughs> somehow I missed the stupid thing because I was looking at the wrong part of the screen because there's like three or four areas where things are happening and I was looking at, at everything except the right one. I only knew because I saw that somebody uh, tweeted at us. They go, oh, 35 seconds. So that's why I knew exactly where to go. I, I watched oh, yeah. it all, but I bet I knew where to look. I thought, oh, this, oh, there it is right there. Um, yeah. Uh, the reason we were tipped off because because um, the, the Kibble's White, uh, Jack and, and Graham Kibble White uh, made that trailer. Very excellent homage to the- uh, Oh, to it was beautiful. Beautiful uh, Radio Free, uh, Radio Free Scar. Hitchhiker's, Hitchhiker's Guide, Guide to the, the Galaxy. Galaxy. Yeah. yeah. It was beautiful. And um, of course, the reason it was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is because John Lloyd, who uh, provided uh, some of the writing for the uh, Hitchhiker's content, mm-hmm. as he was uh, Douglas Adams' roommate at the time or previously. I can't remember the timeline it's exactly. but Definitely a definite connection there with Douglas uh, Adams. Well, they were Douglas like Adams. best friends kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Douglas Adams would have only been 69 this year. 69. Huh. Died when he was 49. I'm just thinking about that right now. Yeah. Very it's tragic. Been 20 years? Yeah, it's been, t- I think he died in 2001. May of 2001, I think it was. May 25th. That's, that's why Tal Day, I think, is basically the day that he died. Huh. I, think. I think. Don't don't quote me on that. I'm just, I'm I mean, trying I'll to. We can look it up. But, the time eh. Yeah, yeah. I, still, I still relish the fact that I've got. Uh, Quite possibly one of the few photos of Douglas Adams taken by somebody taller than he is. As I <laughs> ran into him many years ago at a Macworld, Macworld uh, San Francisco convention. Oh, oh yeah, because of course he was a nerd. He was a proper nerd. A did he? Did he own like the first ever Mac computer? Is that? Uh, is uh, that apocryphy or is that? Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the. the or is it, it Stephen was, Fry? It wanted him, somebody. It was yeah. him, Stephen Fry, or Christopher H. Bidmead. Yeah, <laughs> they We're tell complaining them all in our head. Yeah. They tell I think different stories about. Uh, I think it was Bidmead who said he had the first one purchased in the UK, but maybe Adams was the first one to own one because he imported it from uh, from the states or something. I can't mm-hmm. I can't remember all the details, but uh, yeah, it was either Stephen Fry, Chris H. Bidmead, or Douglas Adams that had the first first Mac. See, this, this is where having three people on, on the banter section, we can hardly call it news at this point, uh, is handy because then Warren and I could banter back and forth and you, Chris, would run off and look for it. But <laughs> I, I'm not holding down the fort just doing monologues more well, than I've, usual. I, I, um, I've, I've seen, seen and heard different like things. Like uh, years, and, years and years ago when I was still living in London, I went to a, a talk at the Regent Street Apple Store uh, put on by Stephen Fry about like the history of computing and the internet and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he mentioned that at the time, but this is like 2000, 2009. Um, right. so I don't really, I don't distinctly remember. And then I remember bid me twitting, tweeting about the whole like 
conundrum of who was the first legitimately. And, and I know, uh, Adams has said things in the past about, uh, about all that, but I, just can't, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't remember who said what and, and when and, and stuff. So it's one of those three guys though. Who knows? Yeah. So there we go. We covered our bases, everyone. We didn't get it wrong. We can probably Google it once we're done recording this, but we won't because no. we'll forget because we'll have moved on to other things. Um, uh, such as uh, on this episode of Radio Free Scarlet today is the uh, an interview with Mark Ayers. Mark Ayers about the season eight and season twenty four Blu rays. Originally, this, this if you're wondering, oh, uh, when I sort of said, oh, the stuff happened in March and like everything sort of went awry with schedules and everything. Um, this is part of it. Mark was so busy working on season twenty four. Um, that, uh, we, I was originally going to talk to him about two or three weeks ago, I think it was, and he had to put it off because he was, he needed to finish, um, 24 and it's done. He's, he's signed off on it now. So it's, hmm. uh, it's all ready to go. So we talk about that, which, which hasn't been talked about much in, in, in the press or anything or on forums or whatever. So there's, there's your exclusive folks talking season 24, season eight, of course, which is, uh, out now in the UK out on June 1st here in North America. Um, <laughs> Chris, 20, Chris and I, <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you're going to bring that up. Yeah. 24, <laughs> 24 doesn't have a release date here yet. Do they have one in the UK yet? Uh, I, I don't I, think they, they do. do though, Cause uh, I, in the, in the show notes, I put a link to the doctor who TV thing and uh -huh. uh, I can't remember if they put a, put a release date on there. Um, I don't remember or not, but, uh, I'm, oh God, no, say, so yeah, I've just opened, I've just, op I've just opened it up and they had, they had the link right on the Dr. Who TV website to the, uh, the tile game. It says, no, 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 no. You've sucked enough time out of me. No, I'm closing that tab right <laughs> now. I never got past nine. Uh, I can't, I cannot waste more time on that. I cannot do it or brain cells or hope. Um, yeah, no. So, so Chris and I, maybe others are too. We pre-ordered it on amazon.ca. And like over the past five days, literally every single day, uh, both of us have gotten an email from Amazon saying, oh, we've updated you. Here's, here's when your, your Blu-ray set will arrive May 17th for the Sylvester McCoy box set. What? You click yeah. on the link. There's no release date. Then yeah. the next day happens. Oh, we yeah. have an update. It's arriving May 18th. Basically every day it advances one. Yeah. Um, and there's no release date at all. So no. I, I fear that we're going to get spammed by Amazon for like every day for the next three or four months. And, and as equally as likely, uh, we're not going to get it in May. I mean, that's like two weeks before season eight. That's yeah. not going to, that's no, that's not going to happen. No, no. At this point in time, happen. if we get it like, well, June 1st for season eight, as you mentioned, so season 24, mm -hmm. August, maybe. I would hope August, maybe September. July, I mean, or August, maybe July, maybe September. I don't know, but I bet you we'll get it. I bet you the UK will get it in June. Um, and spoilers for the interview of uh, Mark Ayers thinks he'll get at least one more out this year. Um, so that might happen. I, I also thought, because I, di I didn't think about this until after, because um, Mark mentions in the interview that they were working on another season of uh, for a Blu-ray set, and then they decided to put it to one side and, and do season 24 instead. And I thought, oh, I don't know why they did that. And then I realized there's only 14 episodes in season 24. It might just be quicker and easier during a pandemic to be able to uh, put out a, although it's eight discs of stuff. It's not like there's, you know, they're, they're, it's not, they're certainly not, you know, pulling back the budget or anything like that. It's not an easier task to get uh, 24 out the door, but uh, I'm wondering if perhaps the, the reduced episode count uh, made it a simpler thing. Cause now we've got three yeah. of the four 14 episode seasons are done. Only season 25 is yet to do. Oh God. Yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, it could also be something like part of the, the van that they're looking to produce. They're waiting for people to be available or for locations to be available or waiting for, for restrictions in, in pandemic rules to lift or, uh, you know, there's any number of reasons I suppose, but yeah, why not? Why not a shorter season as an excuse? Well, they're, they're working around it. I mean, uh, just in the way that they're shooting, where they're shooting, um, you know, is being outdoors and stuff. It's fascinating, actually. Uh, uh, I was very from the deep, finally came out in this country um, yeah, did you watch last it week. 
I <laughs> listen, unlike the faceless ones, which I watched the documentaries as soon as I got it, and then it sat on the on my my TV stand for weeks until <clears throat> I think it was my birthday. I think I was building a big Lego set, and I thought, damn it, let's watch faceless ones. Yeah. I watched it all. I, I watched the entire six parts with commentary. With production notes, because production notes are back. They haven't been on any of the uh, animated ones, like the newer ones, like Makatera and Power of the Daleks uh, before, but they're back on this one. And I love the production notes because it's where I get my knowledge of Doctor Who and stuff. And they had commentaries. Um, and only then did I really uh, it realize that, A, I guess Fury from the Deep hasn't come out all that long ago because all the commentaries were done basically over Zoom, over because... Uh, uh, Toby mentioned, Toby Haydock does the moderates of commentaries and he says uh, at the very beginning, you know, this is recording during the time of COVID. I was like, oh my mm-hmm. God. Well, did was, I didn't know at, that. Um, at Galley last year, uh, mm-hmm. I remember Gary Russell saying something about how, how far along the work was when he went, you know, left for, for LA and it, it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't anywhere near complete at the time. No, no, and uh, and it had bounce all over the world. I think you know, India. I think they did most of the animation, actual proper animation in India. They had people in LA, in Australia, I believe, and of course in the UK. Um, and then they had to do commentaries. But even then, I think um, Gary Russell is on the first half of the season. F- I, I'm sorry, episode six commentary. I think, as I try to remember, and uh, and it wasn't done yet. <laughs> they're just like they're basically saying, "Here's some stock images." Essentially, it was what they were kind of looking at. So mm-hmm. they hadn't even completed it when they did the commentaries, and it was over Zoom. So uh, yeah, that's that's not uncommon. I um, I think the same thing has happened for some of the other yeah, like when they were doing like I don't know, uh, Rain of Terror, for example, like where there's just it's not the whole thing that's animated; it's just one or two. No, Power of the Daleks, uh, they brought in like Rob Shearman, I think, and a couple others in London. They, yeah, they hadn't finished it. <laughs> they hadn't finished it yeah. yet. So they're just be sort of talking vagaries about Daleks and stuff and Patrick Shouten while this episode was supposedly playing out in front of them. Uh, no, but I watched it all. I watched a great documentary where they went out to the, uh, the location and everything else, uh, done by Chris Chapman. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm just looking at the list of special features. So that would be the uh-huh. cruel, the cruel sea, the making of. That's the, that's the one with Michael Bryant and Margot Hayhoe. Of course, oh, yeah. we're both at, uh. And wasn't, um. Gallifrey one. Wasn't there a third year? director that they had? No, no, we're thinking of. You're thinking of. I'm thinking of someone um, on season eight box set, aren't you? You're thinking of season eight set with, yeah. uh, Tim, Tim Coombe. Um. Uh, that's it. And Graham Harper and, uh, Michael Bryant. Yeah. Went on locations one. during that. Yeah. Which we'll find out in June, I suppose, when that happens. But um, um, also, don't don't worry, Chris. I'm not skipping the lead here. But since we're on stuff from past weeks and stuff, uh, the Lonely Assassins uh, mobile game came out on Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a contest winner. Well done to Matthew, who won the contest. Hopefully, 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 May Theory took care of you. I I could tell it was a busy week for May Theory. Get, you know, launching a game is never any fun. Um, that's another thing I did. I played the whole game on Friday when it came out. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> I got it's a lot uh, of fun that game. I got through about uh, ten minutes of it on the bus yesterday, and, uh, and then I had to stop. Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> so I haven't had much of a chance. But uh, was it enjoyable? Did you like it? I, yeah, I it, it it felt like you were in an episode in a way, you know, okay. and that. You know, cause it, it's like, it's a found phone game. It's what, it's what it is. You just put, it's finding it and you're looking through clues on this phone, which, you know, the app, the game, um, and like, you know, texting back and forth with Osgood and sort of getting like, you know, things there. You, you can, you know, it's not just like you hitting a, a thing. You can actually like choose your, your responses as well, which is kind of cool. So it gives you some sort of, um, from a list of canned so, responses, but yeah. A list of canned responses, but, but you know, it, it gives you some agency and you're not just sort of clicking next or something like that. So mm. yeah, I really enjoyed that game. <laughs> it was a lot of fun and it was just, uh, it was a neat experience. And then at the end, no, I'm no spoilers, but like, there's sort of like a report card. Here's the things that you, you did and here's the things that you missed. And I thought, I missed this one. How did I miss that one? Well, I gotta go play it again now and hmm. figure out what I did wrong. Cause I, I did a thing wrong. So didn't get a hundred percent basically is what I mean to say. Okay. I know, um, was it uh, Gizmodo? I think it was uh, the person who did the review for. Pretty sure it was Gizmodo. Called it the the best Doctor Who game ever. And and gadget. And gadget. Sorry. Yeah, and gadget. Yeah, 
best best dog. I mean, and then they sort of damned it with paper. Well, it's not 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 that it's uh, you know had much to go on. I think you know what I fondly remember um, the Doctor Who Adventure games, especially the um, uh, the gunpowder one for four wrote gunpowder. That was so much fun. I had my my trusty old twelve year old iMac died. Uh, in the last year or two, and like I basically kept that thing around because <laughs> the gunpowder plot was on there, and now I don't know how to access it. Well, how do you play old games? How do you play old games for like PC and Mac that are you know the the OSs have long since surpassed what they're running on? So like emulation, I guess. emulation. Yeah. yeah, I mean I can find emulators for like you know old Nintendo and Atari games and stuff, but I'm, I'm, I have never actually looked, I guess, suppose for. Or vir- virtualization software, I guess, depending yeah. on what it supports as well. That was a good. Anyway, it's a fun game. Um, it's in the app store. The, the theme tune, which is, uh, sort of based on the one that, um, Richard Wilkinson composed for the, uh, Edge of Time VR game, which is coming to consoles this year, which I'm looking forward to as well. It's so good. Uh, I, I commented at the time, it was like 2019 when they sort of put out the, the orchestra recording of that to Richard Wilkinson. It says, I love this. Uh, I don't know what they do in the middle eight, but it's, it's amazing and subversive. And he like replied to me, Oh, try it yourself. Here are the chords. And I still haven't figured it out. It's been like over a year now. I did. Anyway, it came up again because I think, um, uh, Tim from the missing episodes podcast, which finally returned as well after like a year because they've been working on a Dalek's master plan episode. Um, they, he tweeted about it. So I don't know what happens here. What 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 is being done at this middle eight? And so I quote tweeted that tw- uh, tweet again. So it's sort of been back in back in the uh, the Twitter thread again. Um, what Richard Wilkinson did to the middle eight, which makes it so interesting. Um, so I adore it. I adore that bit of the theme. It might be my favorite yeah. part of the theme song um, when it's done like that. In the in the show notes, it's only about two minutes long, but there's a. Video on YouTube of of an orchestra doing the the theme for the Lonely Assassins, and mm-hmm. you know, we had there was something like, like that put out for the um, Edge of Time as well. If, if memory serves, that's that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. that's that's where I first heard it. Um, um, well, no, it's like an orchestral, like a video of an orchestra doing the theme. Yeah, um, but uh, but uh, yeah, uh, we were talking before recording. In my in my limited exposure to to the Lonely Assassins, uh, there's only a, a, a fragment of the theme heard at the at the intro. It's at the end when the the whole theme plays. So I've yes, I haven't had a chance to watch the the two minute video, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of keen to do so. It's cool. It's and also because uh, um, the Edge of Time uh, soundtrack is on Apple Music, but the theme isn't. The theme song isn't for no, some reason. They there was a like right... vinyl and stuff as well. I I yeah. Uh, maybe there's like a rights issue or something. I don't know, but, ah, it's disappointing. So, so those YouTube, um, uh, orchestra recordings, I mean, it's the same, you know, it's not like a microphone in the room. You're hearing the proper version and it's, uh, basically an edited music video of it. Um, you know, it's, it's there and that, that's basically been my source for these, uh, this new version of it with the, uh, the different middle eight. So, uh, it's uh, just to completely ignore the, the lead <laughs> you've calmly confidently put at the top of our news list, Chris, since we're talking <laughs> about music, uh, because the, the Wilkinson version <clears throat> definitely piggybacks on the Peter Howell version. It's an F sharp as opposed to yes. E minor. Um, and, uh, uh, Peter Howell, uh, has a new website. He's got a new website and, uh, Peter Howell, uh, hyphen media.co.uk, but he also, I didn't know this until I saw the website. He has a new book called, call uh, Radiophonic Times coming out on April 5th from Obverse Books. It's about his time with the radio on radiophonic workshop. Um, I had no idea this was happening. So that is way cool. Peter Howell is my favorite of all the 1980s radiophonic workshop composers. So I'm going to be getting that because I adore his work. And I enjoy his, the instruments that he used to record said work. So I, I uh, assume that, um, that this book will be all about that. Hmm. And if you, uh, happen to order a copy, uh, I see a bunch of the, uh, black archive books are on sale as well. I Might have a, a good few time of those to round books. up that collection. Those are good books. Those are good books. Um, I bought, I bought like three last year and a bundle and I haven't read them yet. 
which is on me, but I wanted to support them, <laughs> obviously, because they're cheap and they're good. Um, but they're also like, they focus on one story at a time, which is great. I love, I love deep dives into single, you know, singular topics like that, as opposed to a whole era. I love just like, and, and not just Doctor Who, like I have a book about the, um, uh, the, the famous for Canadian hockey fans, um, the Pia Stani punch up, the, uh, bench clearing brawl that happened between the Canadian and Soviet junior teams in, uh, the 1987 world juniors. There's a whole book about that brawl, uh, and the ramifications that, that led up to it and came, it's, it's a fascinating book. And you think, wow, they wrote a book about a singular event. And so whenever like, you know, you think let's write a whole book about one particular Doctor Who story. It's uh, always fascinating to see what uh, what the author will come up with, what take they'll they'll have on this. But um, anyway, uh, let's let's mention this. Uh, um, Doctor Who Red Nose Day happened, or Doctor Red Nose Day happened <laughs> on uh, Call on, relief, yep. on past uh, past Friday, and they they had like a sort of a a spoof movie trailer of 2020, the movie with di- various different, like Kira Knightley was in there and uh, a bunch of other uh, uh, actors had little cameo scenes and stuff. And this is where we had the Doctor Who cameo because there was Jodie Whittaker and Mandip Gill on the set of Casualty, uh, I think, or at the very least they were doctors in disguise as actual medical doctors uh, doing a quick little scene. And it was amusing. I enjoyed mm-hmm. their comic timing together. <laughs> I just like them talking about, um, oh, it's time to go watch Bake Off. Can't miss it. Yeah, Bake Off. And stuff. <laughs> I just, like, you know what? The, the, the part that the comic time that I liked is, you know, Jody sort of does her, like, big arm swing with the sauna screwdriver and man, just get that down. You know, <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the potential of this comedy duo because I don't think they had quite the, you know, the opportunity to be that when there were four people on the TARDIS. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of like that, you know, basically Mandit being the, the straight man, for lack of a better word, to Jody's um, bumbling buffoon com, uh, comic doctor in a way, kind of like just what we saw there. I feel like that's a natural extension of how they are on set as well in a way. So I hope John Bishop doesn't come and ruin it is what I mean to say. <laughs> well, I mean, as, as much as we know that John Bishop is going to be in the next series as, as a companion. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he's going to be there from the first episode, but there is the possibility that he isn't. And it might yeah. give, might give, uh, the, the two ladies, a, a bit of time to, you know, be just a duo before, uh, before Bishop comes along. Yeah. Uh, cause I don't know. Yeah. I don't know when he started sh- shooting. I know he resumed shooting and I think I'm, I'm trying to think about the, I know we talked about this, the timeline because of course he came down with COVID around the holidays. Um, and returned in January, but I'm, I don't know if he got COVID before he even was on set. Cause I remember there was a big thing. Oh, John Bishop is now shooting his scenes. I'm thinking maybe they actually started shooting Dr. Who without him, um, in November when they started shooting, was it November or October or something? It started shooting earlier, uh, and later in, the, in there, 2020. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, he might not feature in it, but who knows? We'll see. Perhaps this fall. Dr. Who might be coming back this fall. If, you know, the timelines work out, you know, mm-hmm. crazy to think about even it. Even if it's only for the seven or eight episodes. Yeah. Cause it but, could, could be seven plus a, a ho- um, you know, a, a holiday type thing. As has who knows? Done. Maybe it'll go so well that just, let's just keep going. I mean, you know, the pandemic is still going on, <laughs> but I mean, you know. Well, there's, uh, there's these things called budgets and scripts and, and, and well, contracts well, and things like that true. that have to be, uh, you know, worked out before they can just say, let's keep going. Well, I mean, if you, if you remember the doc, uh, production notes in Doctor Who magazine, Chibnall is basically saying, we'll try for eight. If maybe we'll do more. You know, it's like, we'll, we'll aim for eight because of the way that we have to shoot it. It takes longer now to shoot it because of COVID measures and stuff. Um, but they, they, they just think, oh, have we all been vaccinated? I think, or, well, why don't we just make a couple more then? It's, you know, this, that's th- true. That's true. That like with the, so as, as, as much as the UK dropped the ball in many, many, many ways with the pandemic, uh, Man. they're, they're trying to remedy things with the uh, vaccination rollout, which is great. And so yeah, Vaccines, maybe. 
it's going well with the vaccines. I think they're uh, they have the second highest rate, or maybe third behind, uh, definitely behind Israel. I think yes. they're like I think Israel's like over Israel at this point. Israel's like over half half their population vaccinated already. I think at least or at least one shot. Um, yeah, and then U UAE is in up there, United Arab Emirates, and then the UK is really up there too. So. Yeah, so Mark Gatiss got his jab uh, today. Oh, yeah. uh, Mark Ayers, uh, yeah, the interview which is ago. coming up. Yeah. yeah, a little while ago. Yeah, we've uh, there's a, there's a few people who we know of in the Doctor Who world who have certainly got it. And you have, you know maybe you think oh but they <laughs> I mean Chris Chibnall's over fifty, he'll probably have his jab. Um, yeah. Lots of people. He and Nick Briggs live near each other. They can just you know go to the local uh, <laughs> doctor surgery and get their jab together. <laughs> yeah, why not? As friends, as Doctor Who friends. Yeah. Uh, also, one, one last thing before we go to the interview with Mark Ayers. Uh, today is March 21st. As we record this, as this is coming out after, later today, I'll be ending the odyssey of watching season 18 because 40 years ago today, Tom Baker oh. uh, regenerated at the end of Logopolis Part 4. So, I, you know, it, it's funny that we talk about, you know, it's spring now. Uh, the vaccines are, are rolling you know, quicker in some places, slower in other places, but it's happening. I remember when I started this back in late August, I thought, let's see where we are. Let's, uh, let's see where we are when it comes to, uh, um, the state of the world when we're done at the end of 28 episodes of Dr. Who with two weeks, uh, break in between there. And, um, so here we are. And so now I feel like I need another, um, uh, thing to sort of <laughs> do on Sundays because I'm so used to watching Doctor Who every Sunday, one episode a week. So, um, but that'll happen. That'll happen in, in June, I think. But more about that later. <laughs> dot, dot. It's not, it's just a tease for some stupid thing that I'll probably do. But um, I think that's it. Is there anything else, Chris, you want to mention before I head off to the interview? Anything at all? No, I'm good. No. Okay, well, uh, after the very short break, it is my chat with a returning guest. It's always fun to talk to Mark Ayers, this time about the Season 24 and Season 8 Blu-ray sets from Doctor Who The Collection. After a pandemic-induced uh, interregnum, the Doctor Who Collection series of Blu-rays have returned with the UK release of Season 8 and season 24 later on this year, and the person whose chief duty it is to make sure everything on these sets sounds tremendous, and it does, joins me today. It's Mark Ayers. Hello, Mark. Hi, how you doing? I am I am well. Uh, I, I hope you're well, given given the past few months and the year, of course, that we've all had, but it's but it's been particularly stressful for you and for the the team behind these Blu-rays. Yeah, we live in interesting times, don't we? Um lockdown has had knock-on effects in all sorts of ways some predicted some not um some of us were unlucky enough to actually go down with the dreaded lurgy and um, which put us out of action for a bit um but yeah I, I have to say season eight and 24 have been the jobs which would never end uh because uh you know we kept on we kept working on them but mm. obviously covid restrictions and all sorts of other things meant that it all took an awful long time to come together um, but yes, we've, uh, we've delivered season eight and amazing that started arriving with people and we've just nearly delivered season 24. That's very exciting. I mean, you know, season, tw uh, season eight doesn't come out here until June. Uh, mm -hmm. sadly, I know I, I, I personally harangued Russell Minton at the, at the most recent Gallifrey one. Uh, and he, he wasn't in charge of it, but I had, you know, no. like, like the stereotypical Dr. Who fan, I was angry and I didn't know who to complain to. <laughs> um, but Russell got it. So, so I am disappointed. I, I'm glad to see like the reactions from people on Twitter who have got their sets now, uh, as we record this, it just, it just was uh, released. You know, people loving the, the Terrence and me documentary and, and the episodes themselves. Um, so it, it, <laughs> oddly enough, I feel my, I feel I, I sort of pull back. Like I don't want to be spoiled from all the stuff that are on these sets because, you know, as great as the episodes are, it's all the extras I think that, that I really look forward to. Yeah, I, I, I have to say I, I have yet to sit down and watch all the extras. Um, I'm so involved in doing the episodes and the trailers and the behind the sofas that to actually find time to look at all the extras is something that you know I have myself to look forward to. But it seems to be going down very well. Yes, the initial reaction out there seems to be uh, seems to be very nice for season eight. So that that's that's very lovely. Yeah, were were you working on season eight and need season twenty four before the pandemic hit? 
Um, we just started season eight, and uh, you know, I thought, to be honest, when the pandemic happened, I thought, oh, that's not a problem. I've got plenty to do. I can get season eight done. I can get that done by the end of June. Um, but in fact, I was still working on it at Christmas. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, yeah, everything just sort of, it, it felt a bit like, you know, a, a slow motion sequence in a Brian De Palma film, frankly. Um, and an awful lot of split screen because we're, <laughs> um, cause, cause we're doing you know, three or four different projects at once. And mm-hmm. we had another project lined up, which we thought was going to be the one following season eight. Um, oh, this little secret. And uh, <laughs> th- that one we eventually decided we'd, we'd put to one side for all sorts of reasons and pick up the gauntlet on season 24 instead. So, you know, people who constantly complain that we won't announce what we're doing next, it is quite genuinely because we haven't a clue. Or rather, we have a clue. We may have an idea, and I may have a diary on my wall which says what I'm doing in the next two years, but um, there's an awful lot of red pen on it because uh, <laughs> it changes all the time. Yeah. Um, well, why uh, season eight is the earliest version, uh, the earliest uh, season that, that's been put out so far. Uh, wh- what uh, led you to decide that the season eight was going to be the next one? What leads us to decide that any season is going to be the next one? I have to say that is a complete mystery to me. And it's a complete mystery to most of us. Russell and uh, lovely Pete McTie are the people who are very much in charge this time round as far as you know, production and, and scheduling is is concerned, obviously in consultation with the good people at BBC Studios. Mm. But they're the people who have the master plan. Um, just as, you know, when we started out, it was me and Stephen, Peter and Paul who had the master plan. And then it was Dan who had the master plan. And now it's Russell and Pete. Um, they discuss it with us and they say, what's possible on each release? You know, can we do this one next? How long might that take you? Um uh, but no, I think I know what's happening in the next maybe two or three releases, but I suspect it will all change. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what, I mean, you know, this this is a season that was uh, <laughs> released 50 years ago, so so we're getting mm. more and more technically challenging as as the years go on, perhaps, as the earlier you go with the, with the material you're dealing with. What, uh, I mean, you know, some of these also came out on DVD uh, seemingly a long time ago, so how mm. much more restoration was needed perhaps to, to some of these episodes on top of what had already been for uh, done for the DVDs? Well, we always look at the episodes for a given season anew. Uh, we always go into it, you know, what, what can we reuse? Um, but is it worth starting again? And on some, some episodes you pretty much reuse with tweaks and other episodes you start again what i always do is i because because i keep everything i'm a terrible hoarder i have you know massive data archives so the first thing i will do is i will reload all the sessions from the last time we restored these so you know i have all the restoration sessions pro tools or nuendo or whatever i did them in at the time so i will open those and i will have a look at them and i will think well what can i you know what can i improve on Mm-hmm. And there's a number of things I I can improve on very obviously from the start or change very obviously from the start. Uh, one is that previously we delivered everything 16-bit WAVs because that's what was then compressed onto a DVD. Now we're into the realm of, of true HD audio on, on Blu-rays, so everything is now done at 24-bit. Um, so there's a greater dynamic range and, and, and a lower noise floor. Um, so luckily the way I worked, it's very easy for me to basically save a project in a deeper bit depth. But what I'm also doing is whenever I use technology like noise reduction, I'm replacing all those plugins with the latest versions. Mm-hmm. So that always improves on that. Uh, the other thing is a technical thing in that all BBC productions historically were mixed to what we call the old peak at PPM6 level. So it was a peak audio level. Nowadays, we have to deliver everything to a a uniform loudness level. Um, So that means that I have to go through and adjust the levels to to hit the current loudness standard, which is actually, um, I love and I loathe in equal measure. It, 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 It interestingly means that I can make some Doctor Who's considerably more dynamic than they used to be. 
um, in order to hit the um, the loudness. Uh, but I also deliver them incidentally, so they're also at PPM six, so they <laughs> they, they meet both standards. So for right. sort of the historical authenticity ah. and hit and to hit modern standards. So I, I have both of those in mind when I'm making final masters. So they are they are authentic to the old standard, but they also hit the new standard. But that's interesting. So as I say, it means I can make things a bit, bit punchier sometimes, a bit more dynamic than they used to be. Uh, so that that's fun. And, and then it's just, you know, what what did I do last time? What can I do this time that I could do last time? So uh, I've now got better routines to sort, you know, wear on flutter in tapes and dropouts, um, better EQ, better noise reduction. So everything can be done better. So it's a question of do I open the session and modify the session or do I then go back to the original source files and start again? And I, sometimes I do. Sometimes I just do an, an awful lot of work on on the existing session, updating it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Peter's much the same. You know, his starting point tends to be the previous DVD masters. And it's, you know, can we up-res the previous DVD master? Can we, uh, you know, undo some of the noise reduction on, on that? And, and redo it in a different way. So it, it's it, it's both starting again and trying to improve on what we did last time. Yeah, and I, and you know this isn't this is more of a video question than an audio question. But I mean the the season eight one gives the the rare opportunity, I suppose, that you are now looking at something that has a either been recolored, like you know tear the Ottoman's mind of evil and all that. But also, mm. I think what with Colony in Space, the initial version was uh, reverse standards correction because it came from mm. a NTSC master. So have has technology improved in both the the colorization and the the uh, reverse standards correction technology since the DVDs came out? Well, everything is everything is tweaked. I mean, Peter's gone through and spent an awful lot of time tweaking the colorization on on the episodes you mentioned uh, because it be, it can be done better at higher resolution now you know everything is done at hd now um and just because you can work at higher resolution and and work on finer detail you can improve things enormously so peter's been doing an awful lot of that um season eight was actually we always knew one of the most challenging seasons because of the nature of what survives uh we obviously made a decision and a little while ago that reverse standards conversion clever though it was was still not perfect uh so now what we do is is basically vid fire the surviving film and then add the color from the ntsc reverse standards conversion so we get the best of both worlds and it gives a much smoother picture Mm -hmm. um we can use the technology that was used in reverse standards conversion and in the color recovery to to de-warp the pictures and stabilize the pictures so there is there is still a massive advantage to be gained from using those technologies even if it's byproducts um so yeah, I think I think Colony and Space, because it's been done this way rather than the other way, and and indeed because of Axos, they both look an awful lot better. And um, but you know we have say Mind of Evil, which only survives on sixty millimeter film with a really horribly compressed, um, very constrained soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same was true of episodes one and two of uh, Terror of the Autons. And bits of the demons, the the surviving materials are not great. So we were lucky in that I'd discovered a better off-air recording or a very good off-air recording of the um, uh, omnibus version of the demons. So I've used that a lot. That was an off-air audio recording. Right. I've used that a lot, uh, not just to, um, you know, rebuild certain sections, but also as reference. And uh, I've developed a lot of new techniques over over lockdown. That was an advantage of lockdown. I was able to spend a lot of time experimenting and coming up with new ways of doing things. So I hope that Mind of Evil and Terror of the Autumn episodes one and two, which were very muddy sounding previously, Mm -hmm. I hope they sound an awful lot better this time round. So, yeah. Were these uh, off-air recordings kind of like what Graham Strong used to do, like uh, like direct record from the TV, those type of quality? Absolutely. This was another guy called John DeRivaz, who we came across a few years ago, um, who recorded Doctor Who from the very start. 
some of his recordings are better than what we've got already from from Graham and the like, and and some are not not so good. Um, that's 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 the nature of the beast. But I've now finally transferred them all, and I'm busy going through them. You know, as as we come up with a story, to work out, you know, if if uh, you know which is the best source. Mm-hmm. Um, sadly, nobody that we can find seems to have taped uh, Mind of Evil off air audio wise. Oh. And obviously, there's only a very tiny fragment remaining of a of a television recording, a video recording off air. Um, I don't. It just seems to be one story that has fallen through the cracks. Um, but that that's that's where it goes. Mm-hmm. You mentioned, but yeah, the, 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 the sources. Sorry for this. You know, yeah. for this season were very very mixed. Yeah. So you know, film, NTSC copies, you know, Claws of Axos. Um, all we've got is uh, you know, NTSC for two episodes. Okay, plus film, but. Um, the sound on the the film isn't great, and frankly, the sound on the um, American broadcast masters isn't that great either. So uh, that it, it all all presents challenges. I, I like then that I mean you mentioned that uh, you know the first two episodes of Terror was a bit muddy and the Demons was muddy, and so naturally those are the two uh, stories which have a special five one surround sound <laughs> bits on them. So so not yeah, only do you you, you you set yourself a challenge of just doing that anyway with a fifty year old television, uh, you decided to do it with Terror of the Autons and the Demons. Uh, I, uh, you you told me before when we talked about the power of the Daleks. Um, DVD where you did a 5-1 mix of that, but at least you had the the original sound, the music soundtrack from Tristram Carey, and also the um, Peter Hawkins' Dalek recording, so at least you had that to sort yeah. of go off of, but now yeah. you don't for this, so how did you manage to make a 5-1 mix out of uh, an old mono signal from a videotape from 1971? Yeah, oh, it's, um, it's one of these... <laughs> <laughs> we, as you know, we've been doing 5.1 Doctor Who's for a while, but mostly, you know, when it was obvious that we had all the bits, mm-hmm. um, like all the music and the effects and the dialogue, clean dialogue recordings, um, you know, as luckily we do for the most part for, say, season 24. Um, but it, it happened when we started these, we did the first first one and, and Russell came to me and said, can we do 5.1 on Genesis of the Daleks? And and I, I said yes while my brain said no. <laughs> um because we've got nothing you know we've got a few we've got most of the sound effects but not all of them we don't have any of the dialogue recordings we don't have any of the music so it was it was silly but every so often i think you have to say yes to something and then work out how you're going to do it um and i'd already experimented in fact terror of the autons was the first one i did in 5.1 uh or, or the first sort of mono episodes i i expanded to 5.1 as an experiment years ago mm-hmm. and it it really didn't work so i i put it to one side but I, I kind of knew what I'd done wrong. Uh, so when it came to Genesis and Ark, I, I thought, well, okay, let, let's let's try this, this, and this, and it it, it kind of worked. But it does it does mean basically I have to take the mono mix, take it to bits, um, you know, spectrally, mm-hmm. um, and then put it back together in five point one. So it it's it's utterly nuts. I mean, trying to extract the dialogue from a mono mix that it can go in the center speaker and everything else can go elsewhere, you know is um it's it's a ridiculous challenge to set oneself but it but it's it's fun and and it seems to go down quite well so yeah <laughs> so it's it's <laughs> worth the effort is what you're saying yeah well i think so and yeah. I, I i think i think the audience seem to think so I, you know, it, it is it is great fun and and I, i've always said in the 5.1 it's only you know in an ideal world you might say, let's do everything in 5.1. But seeing as we can't do everything in 5.1, you have to pick a story where 5.1 audio can help tell the story better. Mm-hmm. Um, or whether it's a story, you know, where where 5.1 can become, you know, some kind of object of wonder in its own right. So a story like Kinder, which is you know, largely set in, in Tegan's mind, um, there's all sorts of things you can do with 5.1 which make it more interesting. And a story like Genesis of the Daleks or the Demons, for instance, the Demons, all of the manifestations of Azal and, and the, the thunderstorm at the beginning, you know, you can really help tell the story using 5.1. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's what we try and what we try and do. I mean, of course, in later seasons like 26 and 23 and now 24, um, if it's possible to do the whole season in 5.1 and, you know, we have the time, then it's nice to do. But it's it's certainly not something we can we can do on every, every season, and the upmix ones are the ones that are literally just a mono soundtrack, which we're turning into five point one. 
um, they do take an awful long time. So you know that's uh, that's um, that's something to bear in mind. And I, we'd agreed that I'd do the demons on season eight, which I did. And then out of interest, I went back and, as I say, opened my old experimental project of Terror of the Autons from years ago. Mm-hmm. And I just said to Russ, I said, well, I'll finish this one as well so you can have this one as well. Uh, so you know, I went back and revisited that. Oh, very nice. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going off of what I saw in the launch trailer because, of course, I haven't got the DVD set yet. I'm not blaming you. Not blaming you, Mark, for this because um, <laughs> you have nothing to do with it. Uh, but, I, you know, it was fascinating to see, like, the behind the sofas and, like, you know, they're separated by uh, plexiglass because those are obviously mm. shot during the pandemic. They got Angelina Mohinder and Sasha mm. Duan, who are a couple, and so they could be there, <laughs> you know, like, so w- what they kind They can of- actually hold hands, <laughs> they you know. Can <laughs> hold hands properly. <laughs> so there's, you know, there were a lot of inventive ways to, sort of get around uh you know the uh, shooting the extras for this uh, well, what challenges did did that uh bring up for everyone involved well i you know the doing the behind the sofas did wait an awful long time and i guess it was probably the main delay because we didn't really want to release it and then in future years everyone say oh that's the covid release Mm. You know, we'd, we'd, if, if we'd done everything on Zoom or by telephone calls, you know, people would always look at it and say, oh, that's the one that's compromised because it was the COVID release. And we'd, we didn't want that. So we waited until it was possible to, to shoot in a way which, you know, where we could do something fairly unobtrusive, you know, like, the, like the, the plexiglass screens. Um, they are fairly unobtrusive. But yes, people will see them. But, but, but essentially, it is behind the sofa as we know and love it. And similar things, you know, had to happen with uh, with some of you know uh, um, Chris's features. You know, he had to wait until it was possible to actually get four or five people together at a suitably socially distanced, in a suitably socially distanced way, and and shoot stuff. So everyone is still keeping their distance, and then you use clever camera angles to try and make sure that um, you know people look slightly closer together. So. Um, you know, and I, I think you know. You look at Chris's documentaries, uh, you know, like the the um, all born one. Mm-hmm. Um, you will, in times to come, you won't give it a second thought that it was shot under COVID restrictions. So I think you know people have been very clever, but you do have to wait. And you know, we couldn't even attempt some of that when we were under tight lockdown. I mean, we couldn't do that kind of thing right now either. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, we are having to wait until there's a window of opportunity where we can we can do stuff. I suppose it's, it helps. You know, the old board one I assume was like you know mostly outside because you're in the village. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The direct route, the uh, where Michael Bryant, Graham Harper, and Tim Coombe uh, go to different filming locations. That's mostly outside as well. I mean, you know, these, these seem like natural extras that you would do anyway but like was there a thought like maybe we should actually gear our extras to something that would be more easily recordable uh, as opposed to something like let's all gather inside a phone booth and talk about Doctor Who <laughs> um, well one thing you can't do is gather inside a phone booth and talk about <laughs> Who. No. exactly um, that, that would be terribly dangerous um, no I, I think Chris in particular is incredibly ambitious in what he shoots and I don't think he let COVID hold him back. I mean, everything is done in compliance with COVID restrictions and etc. But he's not he- not let him hold his ambition back in any way, shape, or form. Which is why I say I, th- I think if you look at these things in years to come, you'll you'll barely notice. You know, it, something like the you know, the direct route. There are no interiors, mm-hmm. of course, because everything's shot outside. Um, and the same with the Auburn. You know, they may have wished to shoot inside the pub and things, which obviously didn't happen because it couldn't. Um, but no, I mean, the thing is to carry on being ambitious and then, you know, do what you can, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, just judging by uh, the reaction and the trailer and uh, the contents, uh, I, I feel mm. like you've, you've probably come up with, uh, with a very worthy um, uh, mm. entry into the, into the canon with this one. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to uh, seeing it in, in June. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know that um, the Americans... American distributor do now wait a little while before putting them out, um, and I think that's, there's all sorts of reasons reasons for that. But it's a shame they can't be simultaneous. But but there is a lot of work has to be done, obviously, to convert 
uh, the UK Masters 260i for the US release. And I also think that they probably want to make sure that the uh, UK releases and everything are thoroughly debugged uh, <laughs> uh, before they make the American ones these days. So yeah, you're you're the guinea pigs, basically. You're you're the uh, the test audience, so that uh, we can get the, the true proper versions. Um, well, I, I mean, it's it's obviously not, not a release date. It hasn't even been uh, announced for the season twenty four set, but. Um, that is one that you just you just more or less finished, apart from uh, some other stuff. The, the restoration, I believe, is is all done on the on the season twenty four set now. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, yes, that's obviously you've got uh, fourteen restored episodes, and they've all got five point one isolated scores. Uh, and then we did, as we did for season twenty three, we've done extended episodes of every one as well. So that's an interesting process. So basically I restore the episode so that you have the original restored mono. I then go through and create 5.1 mixes. And, you know, nicely, you know, for those episodes, obviously we do have the music, we do have the effects, we do have most of the clean dialogue. Um, we do have, we, we don't have the occasional post-sync line or um, things like the computer, the, the big brain counting down at the end of episode four of... Uh, uh, um, time and around, we don't have that separately because that take wasn't wasn't kept. So there's a, there's some little tinkering goes on there to create those assets. But we have most stuff, so I can do the 5.1 mixes. While I'm doing the 5.1 mixes, Paul Vanessis has been uh, creating the extended versions of the episodes, which are essentially the director's cuts. They are the the 71 edits, the first edits of the programs, mm -hmm. but but tweaked slightly because obviously there are things in there which you would have changed anyway. So if there's a glaring error in it, we don't leave it in. You know, if something has been immeasurably improved in the final cut, we will immeasurably improve it in the in, in the extended episode because there's no point otherwise. Yeah. Um so he does that and then he he gives it back to me and then I reconform my five point one mixes uh to the uh to the extended episodes and I do that using the original session. I don't I don't re-edit a mixed version of the program. I, I, I actually reconform the full project because it means that you know, I, I'm probably, in fact, I am definitely and always have to move music around and things because obviously scenes are in a different order. They may be longer, they might be shorter, uh, so the music doesn't fit. So I, I basically create a whole new mix. So there are all sorts of subtle differences in, in the extended episodes compared to the uh, the transmitted ones. Yeah, how, how do you go about with the uh, with the incidental music? I mean, there there have been different ways of doing it over the years. Like the Silver Nemesis uh, VHS, I seem to recall, just sort of chopped in and out with yeah, no, well, it, no. I, I, I we won't be doing it like that again. I can assure you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't know if uh, you had a hand in that or not. That was that was the early no, days. No, I didn't. That was the no, early you, days. Yeah, but that was done. You see, entirely by re-editing the transmitted version. Mm -hmm. um, and inserting scenes from the 71 and and they just literally if they could you know added but they didn't go back to the music tapes either they just went back and added a bit of echo on a cut or something and the, the, but there's the famous sequence at the end of part 1 when the uh, cybermen land and they looped a little bit of music as to cover that big discussion which yeah. now happens which wasn't in the first cut but it was actually two bars of music they looped from the original soundtrack and in the background you can hear the door opening and closing over and over again as well <laughs> because they also loop the sound effect um utterly ridiculous but there there you go that's that's what they that's what they did no i i i will I will, if necessary, you know, loop a music cue, but it means that I don't loop the sound effects as well. You know, I'm just looping the music cue mm. or I will extend it or I will, you know, re-edit the music cue so that it lasts longer without actually just looping a bar. Um, and in some cases, I'll actually use a completely different music cue. If there's another music cue somewhere in the episode which actually now fits that extended and recut scene better, I might use that. Um so there's all sorts of ways, all sorts of ways around it. And obviously the pacing of the extended episodes is very different from the transmitted episodes. So you often find that, say, you know, a big bombastic F. McCulloch Q, which did very well on transmission, uh, is now very out of place um, in the extended episode because it gives too much away too soon. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why you might want to just move things around a bit. You know, they are very much, as I say, director's cuts and a different take on the story rather than just being, you know, just the original edits or just slavishly extended episodes. They are extended and alternative cuts. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I don't. Um, I'm not going to be so high-handed to think that that it was me who caused this. But I, I in that famous haranguing session at Gallifrey One, where I talked to Russell Minton, uh, I said that the one thing I, I enjoy the most, despite all the efforts of everyone involved, is the raw studio footage. And yeah. and I complained. And, and and so I look here, and there's over 25 hours of raw material on this uh, on this release. And I don't know if that's a direct result of my conversation and constant. Uh, battering of Russell because about how much I love that but uh I find yeah, it very I, handy yeah I mean I, I love being in TV studios but I don't think I could watch 24 hours 25 hours of, of people being in TV studios um but if if you enjoy it Stephen then that's absolutely fine by me um, I just I find it fascinating that's all yeah I I, I I I if I'm being perfectly honest I think it gives away too much of the, the magic mm-hmm. um but um but we're all, you know, we're all intelligent adults, so I guess we can all, we all, we all know how the illusion's done. So, so yes, right. I, I, I suppose it's amusing, but yeah, 25 yeah. hours blind. My, <laughs> my, my, main, my main point of this is that, you know, it's nice that, that so much raw footage exists that you can actually cull the, the raw footage from, as opposed to like something like, uh, what, like Ghost Light, I think, for instance, mm. doesn't have that anymore, bizarrely. They only have like the sort of the, uh, the watermarked um, off-air kind of uh, recording. That's, that's, the- that's true. But um, yes, I mean, it, yes, there is amazingly an awful lot of behind the scenes footage from, um, from Ghost Light. But as you say, some of it has time code on it and, and, and very little of it is the bits we needed, yeah. <laughs> which is, which is very frustrating um, in both, um, well, in Delta the Bandman particularly, um, I've been helped enormously by being able to get some raw footage from uh, from those uh, from the rushes which survived, um, mm-hmm. you know, dialogue lines and things, which have helped enormously in in doing the uh, the mix. Um, but it, that's not always possible. But in, in that case, it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, can I admit a very nerdy thing here at this point? Um, uh, you posted a picture of uh, once the trailer for the season twenty four set uh, was released. It's like eight mm. minutes long. It's 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 a movie unto itself. And you posted yeah. a, a screen cap of your audio mix of it. I I All right. <laughs> I did watch the trailer side by side with the audio <laughs> mix to see where uh, all the uh, various things came in. Uh, that that the the trailers themselves seem to become more and more ambitious as each set is released. Uh, what, what was your experience with making this eight and a half movie, eight and a half minute movie for uh, tw- season twenty four? Pete, bless him, always likes to challenge us. Um, and, you know, I always think, oh, trailer, it's, it, it'll be, you know, two or three minutes, it won't take long. And and then this eight-minute one arrives, uh, which needs an awful lot of work. So, yeah, I mean, I do spend, I mean, I did on that one spend a couple of days on it. And then there was quite a bit of to and fro um, uh, with Pete, you know, wanting little tweaks, which is, which is fine and good because he's very good and it does make it better. Uh, and that one, I actually mixed that one in surround, so hopefully it'll be in surround on um, on the Blu-ray. Uh, so, uh, which is the first first trailer we've done in surround. But I just looked at it and I thought, oh, this one's got to be done in surround. Um, so, so yeah, that that you know, they're they're like you know, behind the sofa. You know, once I've done the episode, it's quite nice to do something completely original and completely new uh, and get your teeth into it. Hmm. Uh, well, I, I'm I'm looking forward to that one. I'm looking forward to season eight. Uh, I already um, sort of checked to see where, <laughs> how much space I'd be saving by removing the DVDs and put the new box sets in once they yeah. finally come out. <laughs> Uh, the, I mean, you know, we're, we're slowly getting back to normal, uh, vaccines are rolling out and everything does, uh, as, is this, re- I mean, obviously I'm going to say what, what's next on, on the horizon, which, which, uh, season is next, but, uh, is, mm. is a normal, so to speak, production schedule, um, uh, looking to be a more of a, a, a reality in the near future? I, I honestly don't know. I mean, to be, to be perfectly honest, I think we're going to be under some kind of COVID restrictions for some considerable time yet. Uh, I think, you know, even when the vaccine takes hold, um, which hopefully it will, uh, there's still going to be restrictions in place because light might, you know, stop people getting it. It's not going to immediately stop the spread, if you can see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that large gatherings are still going to be tricky. You know, I've got tickets for a concert in September. I really hope I'll be able to go. Um, You know, but I'm also a performer, you know, with with my band and we haven't, 
performed. We haven't done a show for over a year. Uh, we would normally be gearing up to play a few festivals over the summer. Um, that's not going to happen this summer. Uh, so it's going to take us an awful long time to get back to to normal, I'm afraid. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, yes, we, we have the next one very clearly marked in our diaries. Um, I have said that because I have been working, you know, nearly a year pretty much around the clock on two box sets, I, I'm actually going to take a couple of weeks off um, doing Doctor Who. Um, just to get my breath back a bit, but then you know, yes, we have got the other one on the table, and there's uh, there's other things on the horizon which are not necessarily box sets um, to do. Silver Screen are desperate for me to do more soundtracks, uh, so I, I will keep extremely busy. But you know, I can't. I don't think any of us can promise um, exactly when the next thing will will hit the shops. Um, but it, but I, th- I do think we're going to get probably three box sets out this year which is nice it'll be season eight season 24 and season i can't tell you <laughs> damn that's too bad <laughs> that's right i still look forward to oh i'll tell you <laughs> I'll, I'll throw a curveball in there because i don't love i'm just getting all the questions i haven't talked to you for like a couple of years so i'm getting all the yeah. questions out now uh the uh the randolph tapes uh, those uh legendary huh. uh recordings that i've ever being announced like a long time ago or at least being talked about and then i haven't heard much about them because you know pandemic and all that uh what d- d- first off describe what these randolph tapes are and and what uh, what might be uh, a use for them in, in the future well, the Randolph tapes, I mean, the, a lot of fuss was made about the Randolph tapes, and it was very nice to get them. You know, this was a guy who's, uh, if I remember the story correctly, because it's a good year ago now, whose father-in-law found these tapes um, at a recycling centre where he worked and brought them home and said, you know, you might be interested in these. Um, and the guys sort have of announced it on Twitter um so i said oh please let me have a look you know and then kaleidoscope said you know please let us have a look so kaleidoscope ended up getting the tapes and they thank goodness sent them on to me Mm -hmm. to evaluate them um but that was all cool um yes i mean they start um well they're 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 just a batch of episodes i mean you you know it's three tapes it's a long continuous batch of episodes and like everything else you know some of them are better than what we've got before and some of them aren't as good as got what we've got before. Mm-hmm. But they all go into the pot. So, you know, you've got, um, you know, Graham Strong's, we've got the Randolph tapes, we've got John de Rivas tapes, we've got David Holman's tapes, we've got various other bits and pieces. Uh, so when I come, the reason you haven't heard anything more is because we haven't actually done anything w- where those tapes would be useful. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, when we come to do any of the stories that, you know, like, you know, if, if we were to look at, say, the Highlanders again, uh, then absolutely there's material on the Randolph tapes which is better than anything else we've got. So that will help enormously. But obviously we haven't done anything with the Highlanders. You know, we did um, you know, a couple of other things. You know, we looked again at... Um, people got very excited when we did the special edition of Power of the Daleks. People said, oh, it's brilliant. It'll be a lot better because you can use the Randolph tapes this time. And you think, mm-hmm. well, hang on, but you're, you're, you're assuming that the Randolph tapes are better than the Graham Strong's, and they're not. So, you know, they, they were touted as this, you know, thing which would save save us all. Um, but they're, they are another very nice thing to have available. Um, but when it comes to doing any individual episode, I will look at all the available sources and decide what is best. Right. Okay. Just wanted to clear that up because it was something yeah. that, um, yeah. But I mean, uh, I'll segue that into, oh, you mentioned the Highlanders, given that uh, almost every story from mm. season four has been animated now. I mean, obviously that's going to be next on the, uh, uh, <laughs> on the Blu-ray. I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> no. You know, I, I'm, I'm fairly well down the train. You know, I mean, they will ask me what, what's possible, uh-huh. but it's not my decision as to what gets done next. Um, and the Highlanders would be very nice to do, but then there's lots of other things which would be very nice to do. Um, it all depends what they think is possible, technically. Um, and in terms of, you know, uh, we do have amazingly limited budgets. Uh, you know, so when you know people complain that in uh, the faceless ones, for instance, you know, Patrick is not always wearing his hat. You know, if it takes another six weeks to give Troughton his hat... <laughs> Um, then it's not going to happen, I'm afraid. Um, so, you know, we are working to, to budgets and uh, it'll be up, it's up to other people, you know, really as to what happens next. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Well, uh, but there's a lot happening. Uh, I, I believe it. I believe it, uh, and, and I'm glad it is happening. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, that you're you're well enough uh, to be able to do these things that are happening. So, uh, uh, as always, Mark, uh, the work is appreciated, and your appearance on this podcast is appreciated. Thank you very much. Right, always a delight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I will never not jump at the opportunity to get Mark Ayers on the show. I think he's been on five or six times, not oh, counting yeah. live show appearances because he was on a live show we had the uh, a couple years ago. General. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know we've talked about his music. We talked about Dudley Simpson's music. We talked about other stuff, tons of stuff. Oh, we talked about he, um, Dick Mills with him as well. Dick Mills as well. Before then we, we had Dick Mills on. We and we talked about Mark. And then we had talked about Dick Mills. We just talked about Mark Ayers. And um, <laughs> so always a good time. Um, next uh, next week, uh, you might have seen it last uh, last week on on the socials. Oh, yeah, we're we're doing this, folks. Oh, Torchwood God. revisited. Torchwood comment. Well, listen, uh, we haven't wa- for the most part. We haven't watched Torchwood since. <laughs> Out. I know you watched it sooner, uh, like more recently than Warren and I, but like not like last week. You what, were like what I had watched most recently, and even then, it's been very little over the last several years. Was was uh, the second series? I, have, I had not seen much, yeah. if anything, from the first series in many, many years. Yeah, so uh, we thought, what the hell? We've sort of ignored it on this show. Um, so we, so the commentaries are us basically watching it for the first time. Um, <laughs> And uh, I suppose never say never, but right now, for whatever it's worth, in case anyone's mm-hmm. wondering, no, we do not have any plans to do Sarah Jane Adventures commentaries. <laughs> no, no, sadly no. Um, uh, I hadn't thought about that, so thank you for, for saying that. Uh, what, I, what I did find amusing is that, uh, we'll probably talk about this next week when Warren's here, but uh, um, we started recording those like last year, like in the fall slash winter, I think, November, December, I think. Uh, and then just as like, we're building up to the launch, uh, who FX now <laughs> is doing Torchwood stuff un unplanned, almost like on par with where we are. I think, uh, today, March 21st, he's dropping a, a big, uh, thing on the visual effects for, um, uh, the sex gas woman day one episode two of, uh, of Torchwood. So like, yeah, um, <laughs> because of all the stuff we, we almost, almost landed in sync uh, with our tortured commentaries, which we planned months ago, um, to coincide with who affects, uh, doing a thing there. So isn't that weird how the, how the universe works sometimes, but so that's next week, everyone torchwood, get your torchwood hats on, um, and, and watch some torchwood with us or just, you know, listen to us banter about stuff while torchwood is happening. Cause you know, how our commentaries get sometimes. So, yeah. and, and uh, feel free to either look forward to or dread the, the coming of <laughs> cyber woman. <laughs> Depending on who you are or where in the house you live. Ah, Cat loves it. We have differing opinions on it, perhaps. Listen to to one of the more recent Verities for uh, Verity (laughs) episodes for that. (laughs) Yeah. All right, folks, uh, that is it for this uh, week. Uh, Until next time, I am Stephen at Edmonton. And I am Chris at Edmonton. So long for now. You've been listening to Radio Free Scaro. Find us online at radiofreescaro.com. Follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Radio Free Scaro. Subscribe to us on iTunes and donate to the show at patreon.com forward slash Radio Free Scaro. Thank you.